Okay, hi everyone, welcome. Thank you all for being here. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Margaret Mueller. I'm the president and CEO of the Executives Club of Chicago. Our mission is to be the nexus of the Chicago business community. We are the one place that brings everyone together and the spirit of that is partnership. And so we are so excited to do this partnership with the University Club and bringing our members together with the University Club members for this fantastic program. It's the first time we're doing this and it's just really exciting. So thank you all for being here. Um, I also want to thank our many Signature Series sponsors who support makes programming at the Executives Club possible. Thank you all for your support. We can't do any of this without you. Just a quick technical note. Uh, if you want to submit questions for Adina and Craig, it's in your program, you text exec, E-X-E-C, to 22333. He has it in front of him. I know he'll try to get to as many as he can. And you can submit questions anytime during the conversation. In the program, you have a QR code. That will bring you to the digital program, so you don't have a, a large program at your seat. But it has a brochure, information about today's program, and then it also has the instructions on speakers. I want you to check out our website. We have a lot of great programs coming. Adina is clearly a highlight of our season, but we have a lot of other really great programs coming up, so please check them out. We hope to see you there. And thank you once again for being here. So I'm now going to introduce Katina Panagopoulos. She's the Assistant Treasurer of the University Club Board of Directors. She's also a Vice President at Wintrust Bank, and she's gonna introduce our speakers. Welcome. Thank you, Margaret. So, um, thank you all for being here today. I'm thrilled to introduce today's speaker, Adina Friedman, President and CEO of NASDAQ. Adina became President and CEO of NASDAQ in 2017 and is a member of the Board of Directors. Adina serves, prior to being named CEO, Adina served as NASDAQ's President and Chief Operating Officer throughout 2016 and was responsible for overseeing all of the company's business segments with a focus on driving efficiency. Can you hear me? Is this okay? <laughs> driving efficiency, product development, growth, and expansion. She brings more than 20 years of industry leadership and, and expertise. She is credited with significantly shaping NASDAQ's transformation into a leading global exchange technology solutions company and with operations across six continents. Today, Adina will be speaking with Craig Donahue. Executive Chairman of Options Clearinghouse and former Board Chair of the Executive Club Board. She will share her journey to become a fearless bus business leader and tech visionary, as well as her thoughts on the current economic environment. Adina and Craig, thank you so much for being here. The floor is yours. Well, let me just um, start by welcoming everybody. Thank you very much for being here. Thank you to uh, Margaret and the board and staff of the Executives Club, the University Club as well, for hosting us this evening. Uh, it's great to have everyone be here. And I'm certainly delighted to have my friend and colleague, Adina Friedman, with us tonight. Um, we started to try to do this, I think, three years ago. Right, <laughs> and, exactly. Um, a couple of things got in the way, uh, not the least of which is your very busy <laughs> schedule, but um, welcome to Chicago, welcome to the Executives Club. It's a real honor to have you here with us. So. Well, I'm really happy to be here, so thank you so much, and it's great to be here with you. So Adina and I get to see each other about every two to three weeks or something like that, <laughs> um, but it's nice to see you in person because we only see each other virtually these days. But um, so let's, maybe, uh, Dina, if you don't mind, uh, you know, I know you very well, but I think for the audience to get to know you a little bit better, uh, Adina grew up in uh, Baltimore, went to Williams College, uh, and went to uh, Vanderbilt uh, Business School, uh, and my daughter happens to be a double door, graduating from Vanderbilt Law School this year. Um, but I know that you have been very inspired by your parents growing up, um, and they've played a very important role in the woman you've become and the leader that you've become and the career that you've had. And I wonder if you would just share a little bit about uh, how your parents inspired you. Yeah, sure. Well, it's interesting. They've really inspired me in different ways. So my father worked in the financial industry his whole career. He was um, at T. Rowe Price. And he had an incredible work ethic. I mean, incredible work ethic. He essentially worked six days a week his entire career. And so on the one hand, you'd say as a child, you'd say, well, why would I want to do that? But on the other hand, he would sometimes bring me to the office, and I would get a chance to get down to the trading floor and hang out with the traders. I would get to, you know, honestly help out 
with the, with the administrative stuff in the office. I really felt part of the office. They always made me feel really welcome. So I think learning very early what it's like to work in an office environment. I learned about finance. The trading guys actually showed an interest in showing me the Bloomberg screens and helped me understand the markets a little bit. And so I, did, I found it a lot of fun. So that, I think, really helped me understand both work ethic and my interest in the financial industry. My mother was a stay-at-home mom until I was nine, and then she went back to law school. And I watched her go through law school, become a lawyer, and then she became the first woman partner in her firm. And that, again, you know, just the work ethic, um, also seeing her redefine herself, becoming a working parent, and recognizing that I was actually very happy with it, you know, because by the time she was working, I would come home, get my work done. She was always there around the dinner time, either she or my dad. But it was just a, it was a really defining thing for me to see her succeed and frankly become a happier person um, as a result of working. So I think all of that translated into an interest in the financial sector, um, an interest in being successful, frankly, and understanding how much work it takes in order to be successful any, in any industry. But I think all of those things kind of carried me into what I do now. So uh, many of you might not know this, but um, Adina is actually a black belt in Taekwondo. Um, that's, that's not a surprise to me, having done business with her for many years. Um, that shows up in a lot of, manifests itself in a lot of different ways. Um, but, um, but, you know, one of the things that has always impressed me about you is, you know, you've got uh, amazing discipline and focus, and I just wonder um, what role did, you know, your uh, black belt in Taekwondo play in your development uh, as a professional and as a leader? Yeah, actually, it has had an impact, I think, in a couple of areas. Definitely discipline and focus are one, because with Taekwondo, one of the great things about the studio where I, I teach, or where, I, where I'm a student, is that they accept anyone. And, you know, they really do accept anyone into the program. And to see these kids go from really, frankly, having very low confidence to having very high confidence, and to see adults come in with very, you know, various issues or challenges in their lives and be kind of transformed by the discipline that Taekwondo offers, I think is kind of amazing. But then there's another thing too, which is you have to take risk in life. And Taekwondo is really a matter of taking calculated risk. It's a lot, of, a lot of like chess, but you have to be willing to take offense. And I'm, I'm pretty decent at the offense side. Like I like kicking people, but, um, <laughs> you, but you can never for, forget the defense. And that's the part, like always watching your back um, as you're going out and, and making sure, you know, you can have your mark, you can do a lot of offensive great things, but you always have to make sure that you've got the defense covered. And I think that's something I've definitely learned from Taekwondo. See, I, on the other hand, have learned the art of stop, drop, and roll, which is why we're, <laughs> we're, we're perfect for each other. So, <laughs> um, you know, you talked a little bit about, um, you know, growing up and uh, visiting your dad's firm and, uh, you know, seeing Bloomberg ter terminals and talking to traders. Um, but you also have had a, a really interesting trajectory even within your various times at NASDAQ, um, starting as a paid intern and rising throughout the organization, leaving for a while to become CFO of the Carlyle Group and then coming back. And I wonder, you know, there's, uh, we're living in a time when so many young people are mercenaries and move around quite a bit. Um, and you exemplify something that uh, I've always thought was important, which is the ability to be successful within an organization and to rise and thrive within the organization. Tell us what that was like, and, and, and you must have an amazing you know, perch to see all the changes that have transpired in not just the financial markets, but at NASDAQ during that whole oh, trajectory yeah. of time that you've spent there. Yeah, I, you know, first of all, I was extremely fortunate to go into a company that I found really interesting. Right? So I didn't honestly really know much about the markets when I joined NASDAQ. I mean, I know, you know, very superficial level. But I, I was able to get into the trading group. So a lot of the young people back in the 90s went, who started at NASDAQ went into the listings group, which was kind of the higher profile, oh, let's go meet the CEOs of these great companies and bring them and list them on NASDAQ. It's where all the marketing money was. You know, it was like the cool kids, you know, were there. But I went into the trading division, and I learned so much. I mean, the, the depth of, of the learning curve was incredible. I never got bored. And every two years or so, I was given another challenge within the company. So I never had to leave, 
You know, I just, I was always given something new and interesting to do. Um, I learn, I still, 29 years later, learn every single day in my job. And so having that platform as the place to start is just an amazing opportunity. I think that, therefore, I never felt like I had to leave in order to be able to learn, to be able to grow, to be able to gain new skills. And then by the nature of being there, as long as I have, I've gained a lot of it. I mean, I've, create, you know, I've created an expertise within myself as a result. You know? And I think trading the capital markets, it's an incredibly dynamic industry. Uh, you can't just tap into it, learn it, and go. You know, I, I meet some people. I, <laughs> yeah, I've met someone recently who's recently joined the industry. They came, they came from somewhere else. And within like you know, six months, oh, I get this. I understand this. I, I got it. I'm like, yeah, no, you really don't. But that's okay. <laughs> I mean, you know, th there's there's so much depth to uh, what's happening in the world, and the capital markets sit at the center of every economy. And as you know, I mean, that really means that you get to s sit in the center, working with corporates, working with asset managers, working with market participants, and working with other exchanges on an everyday basis and driving economic progress. I mean, I have to say, like, what, you know, kind of what's better than that? So I've, I've always had a chance to um, experience that every day, and I'm, I'm extremely fortunate that NASDAQ's given me the opportunity. You know, um, when you became CEO and you became the first woman to lead a major U.S. exchange, I think I could say that we were all really proud, especially those of us that knew you and watched you, you know, rising within the ranks of NASDAQ. But, um, you know, I wonder um, if you could share with the audience, you know, how, how do you help younger women um, think about, you know, how to succeed in the same way that you have? Yeah, and when a you're greater going, extent that you have. Uh, yeah, hopefully. Um, so I think, first of all, when you're going through your career, and especially as a working parent, there's some really hard times that you go through. Um, and there are moments in your career where you definitely want to quit. I definitely had moments in my career when I wanted to quit. Um, and so uh, the most important thing I say to women who are coming up through is you're not alone. Don't ever think you're alone. You know, when you feel that sense of just overwhelming pressure, you've got to find someone to talk to because just by talking to someone, it will relieve the pressure. And it could be a parent, because definitely my mother has helped me in a couple of cases. She was the one who was like, get back to work. <laughs> um, so, you know, so it can be a parent. It can be a coworker. I've definitely had, you know, coworker peers who have really just allowed me to vent for a minute and then they, they work with you to say, okay, well, let's figure out how to make this work. It can be a manager. Certainly your manager has a responsibility to help you figure that out. Um, and I've also had sponsors that have really, I don't, I don't, I would say I've never gone and, you know, kind of gone to a sponsor and said I can't handle it, never. But, you know, those sponsors are the ones who are constantly showing, saying to you, you can do this and this is why. And so just listening to them and keeping their voice in your head, I think that is what really has made it so that I've been able to be as successful as I am. And of course, my husband's an incredible partner. You know, we've really shared our careers um, very much so. And I think as a result of that, I've never been alone. And, and just by that fact, I think it's really what's made it so that I've had the opportunity and I've had, um, you know, the work ethic and the ability to kind of make it through those really tough times. I think that's the most important thing I can say to a woman who's kind of thinking it through, you know, kind of coming up through and dealing with those moments in their lives. You know, there's a, it strikes me there's a dual aspect to this because you're obviously one of the most influential women business leaders today. Um, and so we kind of hold, and you were the first, as I said, woman to lead a major U.S. exchange. So we kind of always give emphasis to the fact that, you know, you're a very visible, successful woman, you know, CEO. Um, and yet, I know, knowing you, that it's important that you be thought of as a great leader, not a great leader who happens to be a woman. And I wonder if you could just elaborate on yeah. sort of your feelings on that topic, because um, it is a, there's, it's, you know, two sides of the same coin in some sense. Yeah, and I said that comment in the context I was being interviewed right when I got the CEO job by Bloomberg Markets. And they said something about, do you want to be remembered as a great woman CEO? And I said, well... I want to be remembered as a great CEO. You know, the fact that I'm a woman just happens, is kind of, 
circumstantial. But the fact is that um, I want to be remembered as a great CEO because then, honestly, first of all, it means that it's not as important, like the gender, div uh, the gender difference is not really that relevant. And the second thing is, because I, I, I look at it and say, in the context of all CEOs, you know, there's still only about 45 or 50 of us in, the, in, the, in this S&P 500. So I don't want to be seen as one of the 50 that are successful. I want to see, be seen as one of the 500 who are successful, if you know what I mean. And I think you will be. <laughs> we'll see. Well, you know, it's I have a long way to go. <laughs> it's interesting. I mean, you're closer to the statistics today because you lead the exchange. But, um, you know, we've seen the average CEO tenure of, you know, publicly yeah. traded corporations you know, shrinking and shrinking and shrinking. The last time I looked, it was like three and a half years. Maybe it's even less yeah, now. Yeah, it's about know, four but, years, but or maybe three and a half now. Yeah, probably but you're, you're five years and and going strong and six years. Six years, even better. And, uh, <laughs> Almost six years. Yeah. Uh, hopefully, going to be around for a long time. And so that brings me to I think another interesting aspect that I, I would love for you to share with the audience, which is, you know, many of us think of uh, Nasdaq as an exchange, um, and certainly. NASDAQ is an important exchange, uh, not just in the U.S., but around the world. Um, but it's really much more than that. And I know you've played such an important role in reconceiving, really, the whole strategy for the company, the transformation of the organization. Um, and I think, the, I think the audience would be very interested in just you know, hearing about that and maybe better understanding what NASDAQ really is, because it's much more than just an exchange. Yeah, I, I mean, first of all, I was really fortunate when I became CEO. It was an incredibly smooth transition. Bob did a spectacular job transitioning the role. And also, he left the business in really good shape, right? So it was a solid, solid foundation of a business. And as I talked about earlier with offense and defense, so I didn't have to do a lot early in my tenure on defense. I really got to focus on offense. And that's a great position to be in when you start, when you launch your career as a CEO. And not a lot of company, not a lot of CEOs get that. I mean, that's kind of a luxurious position to be in. But it did allow me to start off by saying, okay, let's do a strategic review of the company. We kind of know we're on solid footing as a, you know, as a business that's highly cash generative, that's really been successful, has really great technology. But over time, you know, we've done things that may not just be in the best interest over the long term of the health of the business, or we've gotten into businesses that we, frankly, just aren't the best owner of. So we decided to do a strategic review and say, what are the trends that are going to define the industry in the next 10 years? And it's interesting. We went out to talk to clients about that. Very few clients could actually answer that question, by the way. <laughs> um, so, so, you know, but we had to make a, we had to make some bets. And I said, look, if we don't think ten years out, then we won't make the investments that will really redefine us over the next ten years. You can always pull it back into three, but you got to start with a longer term view as to where where you think the industry is going to go. So, what are the trends that are going to define it? What is what are the company? What do our clients think that? they see us as a natural strategic partner for? And what do our clients not see us as a natural strategic partner for? Um, and, then, and then what are the tech trends that are going to define all industries, but particularly the financial industry, over the next 10 years? And if you put all of those together, we also then have to be honest with ourselves. What are we good at and what are we not good at? And we did a, a very comprehensive review of the company, and without consultants, by the way, we did it ourselves. Um, and we came to a view as to how we wanted to drive the business forward. And we realized that we are a technology leader in our industry, in the capital markets. We do provide technology to, well, at the time, dozens of other exchanges in the world. Um, we also have these great, incredible client relationships with our corporate clients. We did not have actually great relationships with our investment clients. And the market participants saw us as a means to an end, but not necessarily as a partner. Right? So they saw us as a venue where we could trade, but not necessarily as a partner. So we said, okay, well, let's make sure that we um, redefine our mission. So we kind of focused on liquidity, transparency, and integrity three words that really define a successful exchange, but also, frankly, that really, really define successful capital markets. So we've really leaned in on our technology to modernize markets. We've, re, we've um, redesigned and redeployed our entire technology stack, pre-trade risk management all the way through to settlement. 
Um, we, we're now deploying that with our technology clients. We now have 130 technology clients in addition to our own exchanges that we're deploying it on. We then really leaned in on um, IR and governance solutions to serve corporates. Because at the end of the day, when they co come public, what are the biggest challenges? Developing relationships with investors and managing the governance of the company as a public company. So how can we really lean in there? And then we also said we've got to develop relationships with the buy side. They buy data from us. They indirectly access us. But we, that's a, such an important, I mean, they are at the top of the pyramid <laughs> if you think about the financial world, right? So we, we bought a company called Investment, which is a, a really great networked company. It serves about 5,000 asset owners and asset managers with intelligence and insights that help them make asset allocation decisions and manage their portfolios. Um, so we, we have now a much deeper relationship with that part of the industry. And then we um, really leaned in on, so those are the kind of the transparency pillars, working with corporates to connect with investors and make sure that they have the transparency they need. And then on the integrity side, we've leaned in on anti-fin crime, financial crime. So we've always had a surveillance solution that serves markets and trading firms to help them root out market manipulation and nefarious trading behaviors. But we really wanted to say, we, we, ha we have a role to play here in broadening out and providing full fraud and AML solutions. And so we bought a company called Verifin, and we now have a fully scaled division that serves about 2,500 banks in North America with very advanced cloud-based fraud and AML solutions. So on the back of that, we now sit in a platform where we have a lot of growth. We have, and if anything, we now are trying to find ways to make sure we're, we're managing and concentrating our capital allocation towards the biggest opportunities because we now have unlocked a lot of great opportunity for us. So Adina, maybe share with the audience, break down, you, those are uh, a wide range of different business segments that you're in, technology services, exchange services, you know, the various investor and other related services. Uh, in terms of the, you know, revenue breakdown or, mm -hmm. you know, uh, in general, broad terms. Yeah, sure. Know, uh, so our markets and market tech business together comprise about 45% of our revenue. Um, our, um, our capital access platforms, which is the transparency, so like our corporate solutions and our investor solutions together, represent about 47% of our revenue. And then our um, anti-financial crime represent the rest. So it's by far the smallest division, but it's the fastest growing. So that, that division is growing at about 20%. Capital access platforms, you know, we basically say across all of our solutions, non-trading solutions, we grow about kind of six to nine percent. Um, and then we have our trading business, which is variable. So it's, it's a very, um, it's a scaled business today. We have about three and a half billion dollars of revenue and it's a 50 percent um, operating margin. So it's a, it's a great business, I have to so, say. Well, now we know why she's been so successful. <laughs> um, those are attractive operating margins. So maybe share a little bit on the kind of the global picture because again, you know, many people think of NASDAQ as, you know, kind of a U.S. exchange company. Right. Um, but one of the things that I think has distinguished NASDAQ is, you know, you're a really significant international player on a lot of different levels. You, you own markets, um, exchanges, and clearinghouses around the world, but you also are a major technology services provider to exchanges and clearinghouses and other financial institutions around the world. What does that mix look like, and, and how, have you, how have you achieved that? Yeah, so we, uh, back in 2008, we bought a company called OMX, which is based in the Nordics, and OMX um, operates well, now NASDAQ, we operate um, almost all of the exchanges in the Nordic countries, and then we also, that was the foundation for our market technology business, which provides technology to exchanges around the world. So our largest office in the world is in Stockholm, Sweden, not in New York. Um, and, and we have offices now in 30 countries around the world. So whether they can be sales offices or we have significant development centers and data and analytics and operations centers in Vilnius, Lithuania, in Manila, in um, Bangalore, um, in India, in Sydney, Australia, in Toronto, and St. John's, Newfoundland, and Canada. So um, we have these really large centers around the world in addition to several in the United States, which really help us, frankly, it, it really is great because we can tap into a much, global, a much more global talent base. So we're not, we're not dependent on one geography to find talent. And then, as you all know, with this kind of labor market, it's great to be able to tap into talent all over the world. And at the same time, we have built out our development centers now so that they, for instance, our next-gen trade lifecycle technology has development um, talent 
in Toronto, the United States, Sweden, Bangalore, and in Australia, and in Vilnius now, all, all serving, you know, and they all work together. It's a very modern, you know, agile orientation, as you all know. Um, and we use a lot of technologies like JIRA to make it so that we can kind of create that code repository and manage the workflows really successfully. So you've, I've heard you describe NASDAQ as, a, as an all-weather company. Are these facets in terms of the different business segments um, and the different geographic segments, is, is that what you mean by that, or is there something more to that? Um, and and, and is, is it that um, sort of macro factors uh, sort of offset each other in the way that they balance out yeah. across the different, I just, you know. Yeah, no, it actually has to do with that. I think, um, well, first of all, as you know, exchange businesses are incredibly you know, I like resilient the exchange businesses. Business, so I know a little bit about this. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, the exchange business, as a general notion, exchange businesses are hyper resilient businesses. And especially when you have the benefit of listed companies too. Right. right? Because you have this, we have 5,000 listed companies, they pay annual fees to us. Each of them pay very little, in our opinion. <laughs> But it adds up, you know, so you, you have the kind of the power of numbers there and no, and no concentration risk because we cap our fees at about $165,000 a year per listing. So, so it's, a, it's, a very, um, it's, a, you know, it's a very scaled business and that's very stable revenue. Then you have the trading revenues and while trading revenues can ebb and flow in different environments, there's always a, a base of trading revenue in any exchange. Um, and, and, and we are hyperscaled in that regard. We have the same technology that's deployed across multiple markets. And then you have the data business where, you know, even in, in difficult economic environments, so long as firms are trading, they, they want to be able to obviously leverage the data that we, we provide. So it's just a very, that is a hyper resilient business in and of itself. And then added on top of that, we have what we call mission critical technology solutions for other exchanges around the world to support anti-financial crime and to manage people's IR in portfolios. So investors, you know, investor relations in their portfolios. So it's, it's a very, I, I would argue, just the nature of what we serve in the industry is also mission critical. And, it make, and we have no concentration risk at all, you know, just so many clients. So I think that as a result, it becomes a, a hyper yeah. resilient business. Very interesting. You know, um, you've been you know, leading through um, a really transformative time in the capital markets. You know, we've seen the movement away from, you know, floor-based trading to electronic trading, the globalization of the markets, um, you know, tremendous market disruption in terms of the market crash, the aftermath of significant, um, really fundamental changes in the way that the markets are organized and regulated as a result of Dodd-Frank and all of that. And I wonder if we could just maybe going up to a kind of a more global macro level, and since you have such an interesting global insight and portfolio of businesses, what, what, um, what are the things that you see in the U.S. that are Im impairing our competitiveness versus the things you see elsewhere outside the U.S. that perhaps um, are less daunting? Yeah, well, I, I'm going to start with the benefits in the United States, because I get asked that question, the flip side of that question a lot. And when I go to Europe in particular, they come, you know, I, I go to conferences with regulators and legislators, and I, I get asked the question constantly, what can we do to create the same entrepreneurial spirit here that, that is, you know, that is, defines the United States? And they see NASDAQ as like the epicenter of the aggregator of that innovation, right? So we see all these innovators coming in and, and, and leveraging the capital markets to grow and expand their businesses. And, and I think that um, there is a special sauce here in the United States. And it's really difficult to describe to someone who's not from here. But, you know, so first of all, I would say on the flip, I'm going to give you the yeah, positives please. and then we can look at that, I guess. You know, we allow people to fail and try again. So I start, when I'm talking to a legislator, I talk a lot about bankruptcy laws. You know, we allow people to fail and try again. If you're in certain countries in, in Europe, if you fail, you're never going to get out of that failure. They won't let you. There's laws that exist that say until you pay back everything you'd owed, you're not allowed to keep any of your money, right? So, so there's just... There's just a difference in the, the risk appetite that exists in there here in this country just by the underpinning of the laws that exist. But then there's also the spirit. I mean, you know, the United States was kind of founded by pioneers, literally, and that spirit is, per, is pervasive here. And I think it really just drives, it's a very driven 
a driven system, and, um, and it's hard to describe that to someone else, but you have to live it. I think the second thing that I think is also, we, we do have a lot of regulation in this country, but it's frankly nothing like Europe. <laughs> I mean, in Europe, just in the financial industry, in Sweden, you have three layers of regulation covering our markets. Um, you know, it's, we, have, we have a pretty, we have a pretty um, involved regulator, but it's one regulator, right? So, and you can, you can understand them. So I, I just would say that the, the regulatory landscape here can, can get a little crushing, and I, I would actually I worry a lot about that in really sapping that energy, sapping that risk-taking culture. Um, so that is something I do worry about. But I would have to say I think we're still in much better shape than Europe right now. I think as you look to Asia and other parts of the world, that's where we can really lose the competitive edge. Um, is when we, we frankly either get complacent. Complacency is the killer of every great company in every great country. You get a sense of entitlement and hubris and arrogance. That drives complacency, and complacency then is, you know, is what takes you down. And I do worry a lot about some of that seeping into the United States right now and, not, and taking away that, center, that sense of drive. Because when you go to Asia, the, anywhere in Asia, you know, you can go to China or Southeast Asia, or you can go to the Philippines, you can go to Singapore, you can go any, you know, Malaysia, Indonesia, and that sense of drive and that sense of unified purpose and focus is incredible. I mean, it's incredible. And I think that's where I do worry about the United States um, losing a little bit of that and, and frankly then falling behind over time. That's a really useful perspective. So one of the questions from the audience is, you know, what do you think is the biggest threat to global financial markets right now? Well, I mean, I think it's the, it's frankly the decoupling of the economy is by far the biggest threat to the global economy. I think globally, the global financial markets for sure, but also the global economy. <laughs> so I, I, you know, I, I think we, we... Explain what you mean by that. Yeah, I mean... The political environment to me, we've grown up in an era of globalization and watched how that, while it, it shifts, as we all know, it shifts the balance of power, it shifts the ecosystem within a country. But when you look at it on a global basis, it's an enormous wealth creator for the, for the world. And, and by, by bringing to get people together through global commerce also, you hope that you also find more common understanding, you have more, more level, you know, at least some level of, of code of behaviors that start to, start to be more, you know, frankly brought across the world. And at the same time, you have to accept differences. I mean, I love celebrating differences. Like different cultures bring different elements into the economy that's really special. And you can learn a lot from each other. And so all of that learning, all of that growth, all of the ability to, to frankly find, I mean, for companies, finding growth all over the world, the use of global talent, um, all of those things have really driven in, this, this, in the last 50 years that I don't think we really appreciate uh, how much that has really risen so many boats around the world, including the United States. I think this decoupling, you are talking about an unraveling of that. And yes, we are a super strong country. We are arguably the strongest country in the world. And certainly right now in this moment, we are clearly the strongest country in the world. But we depend on the rest of the world to, for that strength. And if we purposely decouple from it, I just fear that, yes, we'll still be the strongest, but we're all the boats will sink and including ours, um, and it's just a matter of how much. And so that's why I worry about it. And I think that also means the global flow of capital, obviously the global financial markets. I mean, all of that's intertwined with each other. We should be here as the center of the financial system. And we want, we want the world to be invited in to be part of that. That's a great answer. Um, you know, one of the things that um, we all face in all of our businesses is um, a very changing financial landscape right now. Um, we have, you know, increased volatility. We may see, you know, a very strong recession coming on. W when you and your team think about that inside your organization, how are, you, how are you thinking about that? How are you thinking about responding to that? How does it change your strategy and your plans? Well, I, I would say the first thing I always say is um, you want to manage through cycles, not two cycles. So we want to make sure that we maintain our focus on our long-term long vision. We have the luxury of being able to do that. 
because we have such a strong financial position and we have great cash flow. And yes, we have to be mindful of the environment around us. We don't want to, you know, we have to, we have to calibrate to the demands of our clients. But if our clients are still demonstrating demand for our services, we want to make sure that, and, and we're still growing, we're going to continue to make sure that we're investing in the business to, to be able to provide for that demand. And if the demand uh, dynamics change for a short period of time, I've been through several cycles now, so I know it always comes back eventually, right? So you don't want to, um, you don't want to cut off and choke off those long-term investments because, because you, you're managing to the environment when, frankly, two or three years from now, you're therefore not going to be positioned to be able to capture the demand that resurfaces. And so you have to make sure that you think about long-term how you're really focusing on those strategic investments that will make you a stronger company in the medium term while, while, while not ignoring the fact that you might have some demand challenges in the short term. And so investors, unfortunately, sometimes try to focus companies so much on the short term that they lose focus on the long term. I think the best way to handle that is to be very, very deliberate in talking to investors all the time about the long term view having a very defined long-term vision, demonstrating that you are meeting your milestones leading into this difficult environment. We're, we're meeting our milestones against that vision. Being honest with them when you find that you, you, you have some bumps in the road, but talking about how you're going to get through them. And then saying, okay, we will calibrate to the environment, but we're not just going to, you know, kind of choke off all of our growth potential just because the world has decided to stop for a year. <laughs> now, I also don't know whether the world really will stop for a year either. We're not sure yet, right? So, so I think that we're really trying hard to make sure that we don't um, manage to the environment we manage through it. And it's hard. I have to say, this is this weird moment. I was saying to someone, you know, you kind of feel like you know that there might be a cliff somewhere around on the horizon. And you don't know if that cliff is three feet 30 feet or 300 feet. You don't know. And so, but right now we're driving right along. Our, our, you know, our clients are asking for our services. You know, we're, we're continuing to move along quite well. And you don't want to stop the car before you know how deep the cliff is. But you obviously don't want to go over the cliff. So I think that um, we, I think that's where we are right now. It's a pretty uneasy feeling. But I also feel very good about our long-term view. So it's just a matter of managing and focusing on the long-term right now. You know, I really like your answer, and, 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 I, and I think that's the right way to run any business. Um, but take it away from NASDAQ for a moment, and, and because you lead a very important exchange, um, do you think that that's, and, and I don't mean necessarily the, the, the macro issues of volatility and, you know, potential recessionary factors, but um, do you think there's too much focus on kind of short-term earnings and not enough long-term focus on growing the business and the long-term strategy, or do we have that balance right, or do we just have to live with the reality that that's the nature of public markets these days? Uh, I, you know, I have to say, I think it's gotten marginally better than it was five years ago, um, but I think it is still very much too short-term focused. And there are lots of reasons for that. So I'm actually on the board of an organization called FCLT, which is fo it's focusing on long-term capital uh, creation. Um, and we bring together asset owners like pension funds, asset managers, and corporates. And we bring those purposely together to talk about these challenges. So what are the incentive structures that exist among asset managers, among asset owners, and among corporates that keep people focused on the short term versus the long term. And FCLT, their entire mission is just to do research on that, to provide actionable research that allows you to look and, and, and characterize things. Things like, you know, how are incentive comp plans designed within corporates? How, how are the return, like the, the measurement of return among, among um, asset managers defined as quarterly, annually, you know, versus three to five years? pension funds, how are they looking at their short-term versus long-term needs, and how are they measuring asset managers in terms of making asset allocation decisions? How, what is the R&D spend, and how is it changing? What's the capital, you know, ca capital spend, and how is it changing over time? How, you know, the most successful companies out there, what have they done with R&D over time, and how do they manage through cycles? What have they done with capital spend, and how do they manage through cycles? So all of that kind of research really helps inform companies on how to do it differently. 
But I still think that we are probably in the second inning of trying to create a better overall financial system that allows for more long-term long -term value creation. You know, you've also been a leader on um, another, a number of topics, um, one, of, one of which I've been following uh, closely, which is your, your board diversity initiatives. The other is you've talked a lot about achieving a net zero economy. And I wonder if you could just share with the audience, um, you, you know, how do you, um, as an exchange leader and as it relates to companies that are listed on NASDAQ, how do you strike the balance? You know, we live in a difficult world with very strong views on these kinds of topics. And, and, and yet, I think, um, you know, you've done a great job of, you know, being at the forefront of, you know, introducing new initiatives in those areas. Yeah, I think that before I go specifically into the board diversity role, I, I would say more generally, the way that we see NASDAQ's role is to leverage the capital markets to meet the needs of corporates and investors together, which is why we're actually bringing those two, we had two separate business units, we're bringing them together, the corporate division and the investor division. Uh, at the end of the day, NASDAQ serves a role as a neutral provider of a co convening place, and yet, at the same time, we're also here to help companies be successful in the capital markets, and we're, we're here to help investors be successful in the capital markets. And ESG has obviously become you know, a major trend, if not a phenomenon, that is driving decision making among investors and among corporates. So how do we, number one, just help them organize the data, make it accessible, make it accurate, deal with all the proliferation of rating agencies and metrics makers and all that. So we've been really working hard to provide services geared towards corporates to make that less onerous. But then also listening to investors and helping corporates understand, oh, if you want to be able to be in this fund, this is the characteristics of that fund and, and helping investors get the data they need to be able to manage those, those funds successfully. So that's kind of at the core. But then we also are saying, well, there is, I think, I think as a general matter, if you believe in climate change, which we do, then there is a goal, that, or there's a role, I should say, that the capital markets can play in facilitating a long-term transition to a net zero economy. And that is, number one, you've got three pillars. Number one is obviously innovation in clean energy. And what a, you know, NASDAQ is the home to innovative companies. So how can we work with the VC community and the you know, investment community, the banks, to fund and fuel innovation in cleaner technologies and then bring them into the capital markets and make them successful? Number two is the large scale energy companies as exist today are making major investments in R&D. So how do you reward them for the work they're doing to modernize their infrastructure, to modernize their capabilities and make sure that investors are giving them credit for the work they're doing? And then number three, how do you suck carbon out of the air? Right? So carbon removals are becoming a third pillar of that energy transition, and that's a new market opportunity. So we actually bought a company called Puro, which is a carbon removal marketplace that focuses on industrialized carbon removals, and we're building a marketplace. And then we're providing technology to other markets, carbon removal marketplaces around the world, that we think could actually really become a, a, one of the three pillars over time to help manage down to a net zero economy. So that's how we see our role. Now we can talk about the board diversity proposal, which is um, in the S column, or the G column, I guess the G column, <laughs> S and G. Um, and there we, took, we, did it, we looked at it differently. So NASDAQ is the gate, one of the gatekeepers to the public markets, not the only one. And I'm a huge believer in market-led solutions as opposed to regu regulatory solutions, huge believer. And I said, but at the same time, we have a role to play as a gatekeeper to look at um, focusing on investor protection, what are the criteria we believe companies should have in order to be able to tap into public investors? And governance is the area that we focus on the most by far. You know, we have the SEC who does a ton of work on disclosures. We do a lot of work on governance of companies before they go public. And over time, there's been more and more research that shows that diversity on boards leads to better outcomes for investors, notably fewer instances of financial fraud and better performance, but I'm not so, I think that's a correlation. Um, so we decided to put a, a disclosure rule in place 
that says that companies listed on NASDAQ have to disclose the board, their board composition based on self-described information by the board members, anonymized and put into a table that is then available to all investors. And you have to provide that annually. And then over the next two to four years, we expect companies to have at least one woman and one other uh, um, underrepresented minority or LGBTQ member of their board or explain why not. So it's a disclosure rule. It's not a hard mandate. And so our view is disclosure. We are a disclosure economy. It's a great way to um, allow investors to make their own choices based on the decisions of companies, but it does make it so that investors can see the governance of the company and with a diversity lens and make an informed choice. And so we put the rule in place last year. Um, it was approved by the SEC a year ago, August. And so we've gotten all of our listed companies to put their tables out there. And now they're starting to work on um, the, you know, the actual composition of their boards. And I think it's going to be, um, I, you know, it was a little more controversial than we thought it was going to be, honestly. <laughs> uh, but I think that at the end of the day, I think it's a, it's a, it's, it's honest. I think it's going to have a good impact. I really do. Well, it seems to me you struck a very good balance. It wasn't a mandate. It was a, you know, tell us what you have or explain why you don't have it. So right. it wasn't we a call disqualifying it a comply or explain rule. requirement. Mm -hmm. That's know, right. Which I thought was smart. Mm -hmm. So, um, well, like many companies, I'm sure, and I, we've got limited time at this point. I want to make sure we get to the audience questions. But one of the audience questions is, how are you at Nasdaq continuing to? attract employees in this, you know, challenging environment that we've been dealing with, uh, especially with um, remote workers and, you know, how do you set yourself apart, NASDAQ, from the opportunities that your talent pool otherwise has? Yeah, I think first of all, I, I really do believe that having a really strong purpose is, is a, a huge benefit to, ha to attracting good talent. And we, we talk about the fact that NASDAQ is here to advance economic progress for all. And that is kind of a broad purpose of NASDAQ. And I think the fact that we have taken a role in, in helping companies and investors navigate the ESG landscape, frankly, helps with that purpose. Um, and it attracts a lot of young talent, to be honest. Um, also, I think that um, we are, a, as I said, a hyper-resilient company. So even though, of course, there's always the shiny ball out there that, that young people might try to gravitate to, uh, we welcome boomerangs. Um, so if you leave, you go try it out, you realize that the grass isn't nearly as green as you thought it was. We, you know, I left, it came back. And, and you get actually a much more loyal uh, employee base when they return, because number one, they've learned a lot a lot that they bring back into NASDAQ. And number two, I think they tend to be more loyal because they recognize what a special place we are. So, so, so that's like a little bit of a sidebar. The second thing is that we are global and having talent around the world has been a huge advantage for us. We are not dependent on a geography, uh, a particular geography to find talent. It makes a huge difference. Um, and by the way, we're, we're growing in Chicago. Um, so we, are, we have decided that Chicago is going to be a, a growth area for us for our, our capital access platforms business and serving corporates and investors. So just a, just a little advertisement. Uh, <laughs> uh, you know, so finding those, those areas of the country also where you can get great talent and it doesn't have to be all gravitate to one city. So those are my... That's great. That's great. So, Adina, when you look back at your career, what, what are you most proud of? I think the thing that you're, be a hard I think choice. as a general matter, what we're all most proud of is when we see those, those people that you have helped along in their careers become really successful. By far the most gratifying, by far the most gratifying thing in my career is when you kind of know that you, you found someone who had incredible talent and you were able to help unlock that talent and that potential, and then they've gone on to great things. I have to say that's will always be the most gratifying thing in my career. And, and maybe share with the audience, what, um, what can we expect from NASDAQ in the next five years? Where are you headed from here? Yeah, well, we have Investor Day in a week, so I'll be discussing that. <laughs> <laughs> so I have it in here. So does that mean we have to wait? <laughs> so, I mean, as I said, we have three pillars that we really are focused on, and one is modernizing markets. So really focusing on bringing more of market infrastructure to the cloud, introducing more capabilities as a result of that in terms of machine learning and other capabilities that really help drive the future of markets, 
leveraging digital assets, or at least the technology that underpins digital assets, and trying to find ways to make the markets more efficient to support better liquidity, and globalizing that across all capital markets with our market tech business. So we've been working with OCC. I don't know, you know, the, the next generation um, technology that OCC is uh, developing has been, we've been doing, um, we've been working in partnership with them. And it's going to be a, a, an incredibly modern platform that's going to support much more scalability, you know, and, and frankly, the data that you guys have is incredible. So, like, unlocking the potential of, of OCC to serve the industry is just one, one, one great example. The second is on this uh, transparency pillar, and really ESG is, is one of the big growth pillars for us. So what I'd like to see in five years, I mean, five years we'd like to see our market successfully demonstrating you can operate in a cloud environment. We have our first market going live next week, but, um, but also propagating that and really demonstrating that across the world. The second is, is in the transparency pillar, Let's make it so that ESG is a, a, and I mean this in a, the right way, sustainable, and I don't mean it as sustainability, but like a, a sustainable part of our economy where it's less onerous for corporates and it's more accurate for investors. If in five years we can get to that point where we don't talk about it all the time and it's not controversial, but instead it's just a way of people working, yeah. but it's also not a hugely onerous commitment, I think that would be great. And on anti-fin crime, that's a massive opportunity for us and it's one where it's just an, you know, leveraging the best technology in the world to, to drive down cr criminal activity in the financial system. So. Okay. So we have time for, I think, one more question, Adina. And I had to laugh at this one because it came from the audience and it says, what keeps you up at night? And, Everything. Um, no. <laughs> having, well, that's why I was laughing because knowing Adina the way that I do, um, you know, you're incredibly immersed in the details of all of your businesses, I know. And um, so I, that was going to be my answer for you, which is absolutely <laughs> everything, uh, especially dealing with a global workforce where you're communicating with people in hours that are not necessarily <laughs> New York hours. Um, but, but seriously, what, yeah. what is it that keeps you I up? I mean, I actually have to say right now, the geopolitical risk is the most concerning thing that I see. I, I know the economic risk is obviously concerning as well. I am confident in... I'm, I'm super confident in the United States. I'm just so confident in our ability to, to manage through whatever economic cycle comes. But I do worry most about the geopolitical risk because that's the tail risk that could upset everything and that could, that could send us in a very different direction. So that's what I'm most worried about right now. Okay. Well, Adina, on behalf of the Executives Club, I can't thank you enough for taking the time to be with us today. This is a real treat for not just me, but all of us. And uh, it's great to have you in Chicago. And um, it's great thank to be you, here. thank you very much for being here. And um, and I'd like to thank the audience. Thanks for being here, and thanks for uh, being patient with us. And um, I think I'll invite Scott Swanson, our chairman, to come to the podium. Thanks, thanks, Greg. Thank you so much. Well done. I do. Uh, I, this was absolutely fascinating. I'm, I'm sure I know the whole, I can speak on behalf of the entire audience on how much we enjoyed having you with us here, uh, Adina. Just, just incredible. I was thinking about all of the variables that she's gone through in the last hour of what's weaving through her thought process every day. Really incredible. And I will say that it is comforting to know that you are uh, running a global company at the mission critical epicenter of capital markets and really thinking about the global impacts You've got a, a significant business audience here, and it, it certainly is great to know that we've got your leadership in helping to navigate that and recognizing both the risks and opportunities. And uh, I will tell you, one of the things I will take away also tonight is I'm a father of a son and three daughters. My three daughters very much, they're very ambitious. Uh, they are uh, very intent on what they will be defined by on their contributions. And, and what they accomplish in their lives. And I look forward to sharing with them on a leader I know that they're going to have to follow uh, here forward because they want to be defined by what they, what they accomplish, uh, both professionally and otherwise, and, uh, and not to be characterized by gender and the way that you highlighted that importance. And I share Craig's absolute expectation that you are, you are very much on the path to being recognized amongst our great CEOs. So I thank you for that. Having Craig here too, I don't want to, uh, uh, I want to give a moment to Craig because as was highlighted, he obviously is a former chair of the board of the executive clubs and uh, early in my tenure at the exec club, he was the chair and I will say it was watching his leadership even in the boardroom at that time when we were 
uh, actually having to manage and, and enjoy his leadership through some complex situations that I, I was forever imprinted on the way that he led and managed, and we've enjoyed that and seeing and following his career and his influence. So it's special to have both of you and to have you moderate. So I, I hope you've enjoyed uh, this evening's program. I do think this is one of the great ways in which uh, the Exec Club brings people together to have this wonderful audience with, uh, with an incredible global leader like Adina. And uh, I do want to thank Margaret Mueller, our CEO, and the, uh, all of our team at the Exec Club, and the University Club, uh, who, who've worked with us in a wonderful partnership in bringing this together. So thank you very much, and look forward to seeing you all soon.